Hi guys, welcome to my channel NCA Wiz and uh, this being the seventh video in this series of videos regarding Canadian professional responsibility. Um, today we'll be starting with the relationship between um, the lawyer and the general public. Now the first topic under this heading would be marketing and advertisement. Um, for that I'd like you to cite model code 4.2-1 and 4.3-1. The case would be Law Society of Saskatchewan v. Merchant. Now, in terms of marketing, a lawyer must be true, accurate in his advertising and must not appear to be misleading. A lawyer cannot advertise a special service that he's not qualified or approved for, meaning that the Law Society must be um, must render their approval as it relates to a lawyer's specialty, as it relates to any discipline in terms of uh, if a lawyer states that he is a skilled negotiator, he must be able to demonstrate that and he must have received the endorsement from the Law Society as well. So remember those model codes 4.2-1 and 4.2-4.3, sorry, hyphen 1. Now, as it relates to advertising of fees, a lawyer um, can advertise fees, but the fees must be reasonable. See the case of Jabor v. Law Society of BC, Jabor, J-A-B-O-U-R. It states that the Law Society regulates um, advertising. I also need you to see the model code 4.2-2. Now, you would realize that we are primarily citing um, a lot of Chapter 4 um, of the model code. And, and I'm hopeful that you would have seen uh, my introduction video or my first video rather, as it relates to my correlation between the model code and the uh, relationships, more specifically the syllabus of the uh, NCA. So relationships um, is the driver as it relates to the model code. And we are talking now about the relationship between the lawyer and the general public. And therefore we find ourselves more in model code four. Moving along, we will now move on to access to justice. And again, that's the relationship between the lawyer and the general public. Now, access to counsel um, as a constitutional right only comes into being when you are arrested, whereas pursuant to the Constitution, more specifically se Section 10B says you have right to counsel upon request, sorry, upon being arrested without um, any delay. Now, what I want you to understand by that is there's a case, um, BCA AG versus Christie, where this lawyer, he, he was generally a good guy offering his services at a reduced rate, and uh, he chose not to pay taxes. And obviously, he was sued by the uh, provincial government for taxes. Um, obviously, he made uh, a claim that, you know, he was offering services, but the fact that he was offering legal services um, there was no constitutional right to the services or the type of services he was offering. And therefore, um, there was no benefit to be derived from what he was doing. It Generally, he was a good guy, but understand that that constitutional right for legal counsel upon, re upon being arrested without delay, um, it does not apply to all situations um, as it relates to legal services. Um, uh, that are needed by people who need legal services. Now, as it relates to access to justice, we talk about three perspectives, that of the government, that of the law society, and that of the lawyer. And in terms of the uh, government, they have made justice accessible through legal aid. Now, legal aid is the offering of uh, legal services for free for those who meet the requirements, and usually that requirement is a low income threshold. Now, some of the uh, disadvantages or the limitations of legal aid is that it's limited to certain areas of law, more so immigration, um, criminal law, some areas, and family law. Now, some of the issues facing legal aid is that obviously it doesn't cover all areas of law. You can imagine there are many land matters and uh, many who would seek legal advice regarding land matters, but because they haven't met the threshold one, and even if they met the threshold, uh, land matters is not one of those areas of law that is offered by 
uh, legal aid. Remember immigration, criminal, and uh, family. Also, the priority of who gets and how service is rendered and how um, the legal aid operates is based on the seriousness of crime and the resources of those who administer um, that legal aid system. So it's not driven by client need by any means. It's driven by the resources and the seriousness of the crime. You will also understand that uh, legal aid varies from province to province. I hope by now you understand that Canada um, is separated into different provinces and each of these provinces have separate jurisdictions. Um, in terms of eligibility, there is a low income threshold and that income threshold is still pretty low, which means a lot of people who require legal services cannot really access it. Um, we understand that legal aid is actually paid for <coughs> by the government. Another um, way in which <coughs> justice can be accessed is uh, through pro bono work. Now, this is seen um, more as the role by an individual, where legal aid is the role as it relates to access to justice by the government. Pro bono basically um, relates to the individual lawyer and even the law firm. Um, and that's a willingness for a, a lawyer or a law firm to work for clients for free. Now, that's what pro bono means. Now, I would like you to cite the model code as it relates to pro bono work where it's encouraged and it's also seen as a sort of a standard where it's expected in terms of your conduct to offer your services to those who are less fortunate, those communities that are less fortunate. As it relates to encouraging, see model code 4.2-1 and 4.1-1 commentary 2. Now, as it relates to the standard, remember whenever we talk about the standard, we will go to model code two <coughs> or chapter two. Please refer to model code 2.2-2 .2 as it relates to where um, it is stating that it's expecting that lawyers will make themselves available to communities who are less fortunate. Now, um, just, just putting it out there, there was there's a possible exam question that could ask, what is some of the efficiencies in the model code as it relates, let's say, to the access to justice, you know, um, one of the things you can venture is that um, there are some possible scenarios in which um, the, the government or even the law society could maybe agree with the law student that if they subsidize their tuition as it relates to the law school, um, they would have an obligation um, to perform some form of legal aid or even pro bono work. Um, Another another idea that you can proffer in terms of uh, trying to uh, increase access to justice by those less fortunate is you can have large law, law firms, um, you know, mandated or persuaded um, to offer a percentage of their services pro bono, you know, and uh, that can probably increase access. Another recommendation as well is that, you know, lawyers could be um, somehow encouraged, mandated, to at least do one pro bono case per year. Now, just to discuss some of the advantages of pro bono work, pro bono work um, can be in all areas. It's not limited to one area and not, not limited to immigration, criminal, or family. It can be all areas of law. So pro bono is across all areas. Anyone can access it because there's no real requirement even accept that you really need it and you've made the case that you know you are in need, you are in want, and uh, some kind lawyer or law firm is willing to assist. It also improves the relationship of the legal profession as a whole because you know we are accessing, we are making justice or the access to justice more available. Um, I could only see that um, adding value to the legal profession. Some of the disadvantages are um, the expectation you know, it's it's working for free and it really, I mean, anyone who um, practices law will tell you if you are putting your brand to anything, you want to make sure you cross all your T's and you dot all your I's. And that means a lot of hard work, a lot of research. So that's one of the disadvantages that it's a lot of hard work for free. Also, um, a lawyer may use pro bono work as a learning curve to develop his skills. Now, there's no no really issue there but you know if if you really are going to be at a disadvantage or going to be 
at a position where you are prejudicing your client or you are not um, adhering to the quality of service and the competence. Now, it's okay to learn during the process. And if you are a good learner, you can advocate really well. And when I mean advocate, I mean you can articulate what you have learned well and you can be some benefit to the client. I see no issue. But where you are using it as whether or not you hit and miss and it doesn't really matter, remember, you're dealing with an issue for someone who needs you know, some sort of remedy or, or a consequence out of, of what you are proposing. And therefore to um, use it as a mere learning curve alone and not look at, at the interest of the client, you know, could be a disadvantage to the client. And that's one of the disadvantages to pro bono work where a lawyer uses it as his learning curve, but doesn't really consider um, the client being part as well. Now, law firms can also make it difficult for new lawyers in terms of uh, the disadvantage for pro bono work um, as it relates to, uh, you know, new lawyers coming out there um, and, uh, you know, a lawyer is, let's say, going up against a client who is, um, is in need of access to justice and a new lawyer is working pro bono because he can't get as much clients. You know, you, you have, you do have the bullying effect and therefore, um, you know, once, once a lawyer um, is working pro bono, um, it's, it's not written in stone that it's going to be a bullying situation, but certainly there's going to be a show of muscles and uh, therefore the new lawyer can be put at a disadvantage. Now, some of the other aspects of access to justice would be contingency fees. You know, you can make your service available and only upon um, success would you be paid. Now, the truth is, is that um, that is kind of a risky and also um, it is based on the success. It is very popular in personal injury cases and we have in, uh, in, in uh, the US what we call what we call the ambulance chasers, where they really understand that the insurance company will be paying out. So these guys are all happy to work um, under the contingency fee scenario. We also have insurance plans for um, legal or, or for insurance plan where it provides legal insurance. So where a person needs to, or in a situation where they need to access um, legal counsel, if they pay for insurance um, during a period of time, obviously they can get this, the funds so that they can retain legal counsel. Now, this is not so developed in, in Canada. Another aspect is empowering um, other um, professionals, um, other supporting professionals like paralegals and the, the IRCC also have consultants which they train in, uh, in immigration. Those are persons who can certainly be um, of much added value to the legal profession as it relates to empowering those professionals. Um, and they obviously can um, be more accessible at a much more uh, reasonable uh, fee. So that brings us to the end of chapter four of the model code as it relates to um, a lawyer's relationship with the general public. Um, and uh, I hope you understand everything that was said. And if you do like this video, please don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like and uh, please recommend. I'll see you on the next one. Thank you.